So welcome to the uh, perspective unit of uh, week five in which we integrated all the chips that we built before into uh, a full-blown uh, computer system. And uh, during this week, we discussed uh, two different computer architectures, the uh, von Neumann architecture and the Harvard architecture. So perhaps we can start the uh, perspective unit by uh, asking you, Noam, to uh, uh, summarize for us the main architectural differences between uh, von Neumann and Harvard. Well, in, the, in our hack computer, we had a separate read-only memory for the program and a separate data memory that was read-write. Separating between these two different memories is sometimes called the Harvard architecture, uh, which I tend to view as just a flavor, if you wish, of a von Neumann architecture. In a classic von Neumann architecture, you have a single memory that contains both the data and the program. As we explained in the second unit of this week, uh, doing it the classical way has a tiny complication that you need to separately fetch an instruction, that is, access a program instruction, and separately at a different time, at the next cycle, execute the program which, which requires f uh, accessing the data memory. In our Harvard architecture, we had the program in a separate memory unit. Basically, we could do both of them in a single cycle, which made it a bit simpler. Now, uh, this architecture, as is, is probably uh, very appropriate for sometimes what's called embedded computers, where for a computer that does a single thing that was pre-programmed to it and just put into ROM. A general purpose computer in which you want to uh, keep on changing the program that you run, you would probably need a full, real uh, von Neumann architecture. The differences are not that big between these two uh, uh, architectures, as we saw in uh, Unit 2 of this week, uh, and we chose to, to take the simplest one, again, keeping with the simplicity of our whole approach. So, Noam, if I understood your uh, explanation, uh, one implication of moving from Harvard to uh, von Neumann architecture is that in von Neumann, we expect the computer to do different things at different cycles or different points of time. So, is there some organized way in computer science to, uh, to model this, uh, 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 this different behavior of computers? Absolutely. The standard way of doing it is via the formalism of a finite state machine. A specification of the different things that the computer is supposed to do at different time steps and how it's supposed to move from one state into another. Let me demonstrate. Okay, so the idea is that for every possible state that the machine can be in, that the, you have a, a circle, and you have arrows between the different, different circles or different states of the machine that tell you from which state do you move to which other state and why. In each state, you can write what are the kind of things that the machine needs to do in that situation. For example, maybe in this state, you want to add one to the program counter, and maybe you want a certain address to uh, get a certain value, for example, the value from the memory address, addressed by A. And so on, in every different state, you can write this information in terms of the state. This gives you a very clear picture of what needs to be done in every possible state and where, what kind of state do you move for, do you move to after everything that happened. For example, you may move from here to here if the, clock, uh, if the current clock cycle changed or if the current memory location has value zero or various other uh, situations that are, can be found in the hardware, the values of the different hardware logic. So once you specify this in this kind of a formalism, in this kind of finite state machine formalism, now we can translate this to the normal registers and combinatorial logic that we already know. The trick would be to simply add another register that is called state, a register that will encode in which one of these cycles are we in. In our situation, we will need two bits to encode three possible states. So we'll have here two bits. Once we have this state register, now we can write combinatorial logic that basically affects everything that we need. So for example, if the two bits, this is just a register, it has two bits going in and two bits going out, but all the combinatorial logic that we have can also accept the state as part of its input, like it accepts the program counter as part of its input, and so on. Different combinatorial parts of our, of our computer accept various input, now they also have this input, the state. And of course, they can do different things according to the different state. 
including deciding what the next state is going to be, again, as a function of the current state and all the other hardware signals in the computer. So the way you translate from this formalism, from the finite state machine formalism, to this actual implementation is pretty straightforward and, uh, and oh, completely technical, if you wish. Once you actually coded everything, it's just like you uh, organized hardware previously. And that's an organized way to uh, design computers that do different things in different times and move between the different times and different states in an organized manner. One question that typically comes up uh, when we teach uh, this part of the course is that uh, the heck computer can interact with a keyboard and a screen. And uh, the question is, what does it take to connect uh, a computer to more uh, peripheral devices uh, you know, in addition to a keyboard and a screen? So indeed, real computers have many peripheral units, uh, which are the screen, the keyboard, um, mouse, uh, microphone, uh, disk, and uh, so on and so forth. And also, this architecture is scalable. We can add more uh, devices uh, as we please. And the question indeed is, how can you possibly do it? Well, uh, just like we did with the uh, screen and the keyboard, we can allocate uh, memory space to represent every one of these peripheral devices. And when we want to write something, for instance, when we want to sound something on the microphone or write something to the disk, we can write into memory uh, certain codes that are later, uh, later will be translated into uh, physical signals that actually uh, operate these uh, peripheral devices. But at some point, when you add several such uh, uh, peripheral devices, the CPU becomes extremely overloaded because the poor CPU has to not only run your program but also manage all these peripheral devices. So the typical approach is to offload uh, the CPU from all this uh, uh, headache and use what is known as device controllers. So typically when you add, for example, a disk, the disk will be equipped with a, a device controller, which is a dedicated uh, 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 hardware which knows how to manage the disk, which knows how to translate uh, operations from uh, uh, what the CPU wants to do uh, to actual movements of the disk uh, and so on. And something like this happens with every uh, particular uh, I.O. device. Uh, and for example, take the screen. In the uh, uh, hack platform, the screen is managed in a very simplistic way. When you want to turn on and off a pixel, you simply turn on and off uh, a bit in memory and uh, uh, you assume that at some point this, uh, this uh, manipulation will be uh, refreshed or will, will cause uh, the screen to be uh, refreshed. So the CPU is in charge for everything. If you want to draw a line, the CPU has to actually write all these points, uh, uh, all these bits into memory, and, and the line will get uh, drawn uh, uh, at a certain point of time. In a real computer, uh, the screen comes equipped with uh, a graphics card or some graphics uh, accelerator, and uh, this is a dedicated computer that can do all sorts of things uh, internally. So if uh, we want to draw a line from one coordinate to another, we can simply tell the controller, go ahead and do it, and the controller will, you know, will do everything which is necessary to compute you know, which pixels have to be turned on and off, uh, and so on. So once again, we can uh, add uh, many uh, uh, I.O. devices as we please. Um, in principle, it will be very similar to what we did with the screen and the keyboard, but there are numerous details uh, involved which are uh, uh, specific to all these different devices.